Hello, I'm Mary Fayton and welcome to Cover to Cover. The program is presented by Writing WA, the peak body for writing and related activities in Western Australia. On Cover to Cover, I meet up with the author of Writing WA's Book of the Month. Today, my guest is writer, education consultant and current State Library of Western Australia J.S. Batty Memorial Fellow Ian Reid to discuss his latest book, The Mind's Own Place. Ian, welcome to Cover to Cover. Thank you, Mary. Now, the book brings together five main characters who all arrive at the Swan River Colony, and they're either free settlers or convicts. And the way that this book came about is, is really interesting. It has quite a few layers to it, beginning with when you were a heritage consultant with the city of South Perth over a decade ago. That's right, that's right. Because when I was doing this research on the history of the old mill, which of course is one of the earliest surviving colonial buildings in Western Australia, I came across the story of a fascinating ex-convict called Thomas Brown, who modified the mill in a rather adventurous way uh, after it had become dilapidated and long past its time as a flour mill. And when I looked into his history, I realised that there was something not only very sad, even tragic at times, but something that illuminated his times, his period and, and the place. But the idea for the story as a, as a fully fledged novel really got underway later when I encountered through my other research the story of someone who was a contemporary of Thomas Brown and who, like him, was an ex-convict from a reasonably respectable background, we would say a white-collar convict. And this fellow, Alfred Lech, was much more successful than Thomas Brown and yet they had, there were similarities and differences and connections between them. So that's really what set me going. And the beginning of the novel was in realising how those two could be integrated within the one story. And then there was another piece of delight on top of that when you discovered that one of the people on the colony who had befriended Satan Brown was actually the colony's first detective. Exactly right. Thomas Rowe, who is runty in my story, uh, is someone who, in real life, in, in historical fact, came out with the last of the convict ships, probably in disguise, although the details of that um, were not very clear, and that's exactly what a fiction writer wants, plenty of space for invention. And he came out to keep an eye on the Irish political prisoners, the Fenians, among whom was the well-known John Boyle O'Reilly, who later escaped and so on. But this fellow Thomas Rowe was a fascinating character because when I looked at the ship's manifest, that is the list of people who were on board, there wasn't any detective Thomas Rowe. He wasn't listed among the passengers. He wasn't among the warders. But there was a Thomas Rowe listed among the convicts. And although that may be a sheer coincidence and perhaps he came under some other name, that was enough for me to start to invent a bit of a story around him. So I had three three of my characters at that stage, but I wanted to go further than just the three men because otherwise it would have been a story simply about men and I wanted to know about women in those times and places. So you chose two free settler characters, Polly and Amelia. That's right. Tell me about the origins of those characters. Well, the connections were fairly obvious once I started to look into the, into the historical facts. Although I couldn't find out much detail about either of them, which is not surprising because women in those days uh, tended not to appear much in the historical record, which is partly why I wanted to write about them. But Polly was the niece of Alfred Lech and married Thomas Brown. So that was a family connection, which was fortuitous, and that gave me some uh, idea of, of how to start to develop a plot around that. And Amelia was someone who came out um, uh, as a free settler and uh, married Alfred Lech. So they were, they were wives uh, and wives only, as it were, in the, in the historical mm. record. But um, I did discover a little bit more, just enough to, to be able to glimpse uh, what Polly might have been like in, in reality and build my character on that. When I discovered that the Batty Library, the research part of the State Library, has uh, a diary kept by Polly's father, Alfred's brother, uh, when they came out, when the family came out on the ship. So it's, it's a voyage diary. And there are little glimpses of Polly as a somewhat immature, perhaps somewhat flirtatious young woman. 
and a few other things, little details that I built my character on. In the case of Amelia, there's very little. Um, and so I let my imagination range freely. But with all five of them, because those are the five main characters you mentioned, two women and, and three men, I wanted not just to tell the story of their time here in what was then the Swan River Colony, but to give some idea of what sorts of things might have brought them to this place. Mm. Because I wanted it to be a story about what it was that displaced many people, voluntarily or involuntarily, in England in the mid-19th century. And so what we call the Industrial Revolution is there in the background of the story. I want to go back to that because that is a very interesting aspect of, of the writing of this book. But first of all, I want to talk a little bit more about Thomas Satan Brown and Alfred Lech because um, they were quite different in terms of what was available to you um, Thomas Satan Brown, for example, was quite the letter writer. Yes, so you had quite a lot of clues, didn't you? Yes, I did, because the sorts of letters that survive are mainly angry letters from him written to authorities in Western Australia, to the Director of Public Works and the Governor and various others, protesting about the fact that he, as a trained architect and civil engineer, because he'd had quite a, a significant professional career back in England, before he fell foul of the law, that he, as a trained professional, was, he thought, being thwarted and obstructed in his attempts to uh, deploy his talents, uh, not only for his own benefit, but for the benefit, he thought, of, of the new uh, colony. And he had some really interesting schemes, which attracted quite a lot of public support in meetings and so on, uh, for improving the harbour in Fremantle, for developing a rail between uh, Fremantle and, and Perth and, and so on. He was full of ideas and they were ideas which were based on professional knowledge, but he couldn't get a hearing um, but from the authorities. his personality got in the way of things. It he did. He, he had was a, a real very, chip on his shoulder. Exactly. He was a very abrasive person. And, um, and so that was part of what I wanted in developing the entirely fictitious part of the story about his growing up and so on. That's what I wanted to give some basis for. So with, with Thomas, as with the other characters, I've tried to establish a family background which does something to shed some light on the kind of person they turned out to be. In Thomas's case, a very difficult person, talented, luckless, getting in his own way as often as not. But then even with all of the, knowing all of those things about his personality, that wasn't the reason he was called Satan. No, that's right. Uh, he, was, he was nicknamed Satan in reality. That's not my invention. Um, and it turns out that it wasn't because of any assessment of his character. On the whole, he was, he was a, a good bloke, a decent fellow, despite his rough exterior. But he was called Satan because he had uh, extremely black hair and a sallow complexion, and perhaps there were other aspects of his appearance that, that suggested this. So uh, I've built that into the story. Mm. And yet with Alfred Lech, there was very little for you to work with, I understand. That, that's true in a sense, um, but I was very fortunate in that uh, one of his descendants began, had begun some while ago a genealogical inquiry into her family and discovered some things about Alfred Lech. And she then worked on it as, as a, um, a, a student, a research student in history and wrote an article which was where I came across his story. And that led me to court records of his trial in the UK. And so that part of his story in England is based on fact. Mm -hmm. He was someone who had fallen foul of, of the law um, and I was able to piece together a certain amount about that. But as a person, he was not uh, given to self-expression in the way that Satan Brown was. He wasn't firing off letters everywhere uh, in his maturity. Mm. So um, one had to piece together a picture of what he might have been like from the things that are known about his activities. I want to go back to the way that you wanted to tell the story about their earlier lives in England and what brought them to Australia because in fact that was the hardest task you set yourself in writing this book, wasn't it? Well, it was simply because it was a long time ago and a long way away. And uh, even if I had had the time and, and means to visit all the places where I wanted to locate those characters, 
um, that wouldn't have told me very much because we, uh, we're looking at people who, whose lives were shaped 180 years ago or thereabouts. And so everything has changed. I therefore had to depend a lot on archival research, on newspaper uh, records and so on to build my sense of what these places would have been like. Mind you, except in the case of Alfred and Polly, I located my characters in places where they probably didn't, didn't live in reality. I wanted to distribute them across different parts of England where the industrial upheaval uh, in the world of, of um, pottery manufacturing, uh, textile mills, railway development and so on was uh, creating such pressure on, on communities and families and that was part of the story. But yes, it was difficult. I had to do a, a lot of painstaking research. But correspondingly, it was quite gratifying to feel when I thought I'd got things right that I had developed an episode or two which brought those characters and those times to life, at least to my satisfaction. Let's talk about some of the specifics in that because there was, it was very evocative what you managed to portray in that space. For example, um, one of the relatives of Alfred Letch, who was doing the, the fur pulling, Is that, am I correct in that It's actually It's actually Thomas Brown's Thomas sister, Brown's sister. Uh, in, in London, in one of the slums in London and uh, desperate to, to get a few pence to, um, to, for food for her kids and so on, she was resorting to a, a terrible uh, kind of um, employment. Uh, fur pulling meant that you were, you were having to take dead rabbits delivered to you and, as the term suggests, pull their fur off but in such a way that it could be used for various garments. Uh, and it meant that the air was full of fur, it meant that people were breathing in uh, an unhealthy kind of atmosphere and uh, I wanted to portray that even just in passing in one chapter as a reminder that there were lots of ways in which poverty and limited opportunity meant that some people were in, di in dire straits and this is something that, that Thomas in his relatively comfortable situation uh, before his conviction is very much aware of it. It's something that tugs at his conscience because his parents are not able or willing to help uh, his sister. And beyond the, the big picture ideas and concepts of where these characters came from, it was all the painstaking research you must have had to go to to find out the details that would have you know, been very minor in, in, even in a sentence of, of the book, but for example, uh, how long it would take to travel from one place to another. Exactly. Um, one, needed to, one needed to look very hard to find that sort of information. I was delighted when I came across online uh, an 1830s encyclopedia in Britain which told me how long it would take to travel by a particular kind of coach from London to Liverpool, which is exactly what I needed to know, that kind of thing. But just the day-to-day -day, um, day -day existence in working class towns, uh, I used all kinds of resources. There was a, uh, a diary, an autobiography, not a diary, an autobiographical account by someone who had been a young boy in one of the Potteries towns. That was a, a very rich treasure trove for me to use in building up some of the background for, for uh, Thomas Rowe. Um, and in other cases too, um, there was a great deal of information available once I started digging, but it did take a while. Mm, and it's easy to forget when you're immersed in, in the detail of the book how much trawling it takes to bring that information into the story as well. Part of the challenge, of course, is that when you really do get immersed as a researcher in some of this material, it's hard to let go of it all and sometimes you do have to cut back, cut back and say, well, that's a nice little thing but it doesn't really belong in the story anymore. Um, and another aspect of that is, is the language that uh, I've given, the dialect that I've given to some of the characters in different parts of England. If I had reproduced um, things in, in a purely authentic way, it would have been distracting because it would have been just too much, you know, like a, like a comedy show or something where everybody speaks in a, a weird way. So I had to do my research linguistically but then tone it down. 
so that there was a, a comfortable bridge for the modern reader between the way we talk and the way people would have talked in mm. particular places. And time. then sometimes that research brought you unexpected treasures as well, didn't it? For example, uh, when you were researching for Amelia and discovered the character of the mayor in the textile, in the textile industry. Exactly, connection. exactly. Yes, I didn't know much about uh, the problems in textile mills in, in Lancashire, I must say, in those days <laughs> until I started to dig around. And uh, I settled on one particular town, arbitrarily, uh, where there was uh, a mill and uh, read a lot about it and a particular person who as you say was the mayor of that place uh, for a while and a, a very benign mill owner unlike some of the dastardly villains one's heard about um, he was someone who had a great uh, care and concern for his employees and so it occurred to me to start off the section with Amelia by having a conversation between the mill owner and Amelia so that got me started. Another example would be that in the case of Thomas, I decided arbitrarily again that I would locate his, um, his early chapters uh, in a place that was situated really at the uh, railway crossroads between Liverpool and Manchester on the one hand and <coughs> then on the north-south line. Again, it was right in the right place. So I read about this place, Newton, and in doing so, I discovered that there was a, a diary that had been published, or reminiscences, by someone who subsequently became very famous. His name was Daniel Gooch. And he became one of the, he became Sir Daniel Gooch. He was uh, very wealthy, he was in Parliament and so on. But in his boyhood, he had been an apprentice in the foundry in this town. So it occurred to me to put them together, Thomas and Daniel, and then that led me to rethink some of Thomas's character because the nature of the relationship that I established fictitiously between these two uh, gave me the basis for developing something that is very important, I think, in Thomas's character, which is his um, particularly intense relationship to males that, that he admires and his difficulty with women. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk now, having thought about the research element of it, about what the book is actually about. Because once the characters have all arrived in Western Australia, mm. um, you know, there's a strong narrative that that emerges through this story. It's not just it's not just a recount of that that time in the colony, and Thomas Brown and his his. He's, he's a sympathetic character in this, I think, in the sense that you can't help feeling sadness for someone who has so much potential and is just thwarted at every, at every different place that he, mm. he tries to focus it. So what happens to Thomas Brown? Well, Thomas is someone who is continually frustrated because his capacities exceed his opportunities. At least that's how he sees it. And that makes him difficult, as we've said before. It makes him difficult to live with or to be with. It makes it frustrating to family and friends at times. But for him, it must have been just intensely um, troubling to feel that he had so much to give and that the opportunities weren't there. So after being knocked back in his attempts to uh, engage in various public schemes, projects for this and projects for that, not getting anywhere, he decides uh, to do something uh, privately, that is to, uh, to carry out triumphantly, this is his plan, um, a business project that will show everybody what he's capable of. And he has the idea, and this is of course factually based, that he will take the dilapidated old mill and turn it into something grand, something resembling what we would think of as a resort hotel and a, uh, a picnic park. Um, and he puts a great deal of energy, imagination uh, into this, and a great deal of money, much of which is borrowed, of course, uh, having leased the, the old mill for this purpose. And in some ways, and this is where, where the sadness is, he was ahead of his time because 20 years later, the timing would have been great. The, the Perth Zoo was then was built 20 years later, um, hotels were being built there and so on. But South Perth at the time that he worked on the old mill and tried to refashion it in this unrealistically uh, visionary way, 
was just a tiny place and he had to bring people across. So he, he got further and further into the complexities of his scheme. Um, for example, hiring paddle steamers to bring people over, advertising relentlessly, and having his wife, Polly, uh, do a huge amount of work on the place while he sat in an office in, in central Perth and waited for business. Uh, which didn't really materialise to the extent that he'd hoped. I won't say more because I'd like to think that people might read the book and actually be interested in knowing how it all turns out exactly, but that's part of the story. And it's really great that you've brought the, the old mill into this story because, as you said at the beginning, it is the oldest colonial structure still in, in Perth CBD, at least. Um, and it, I was fascinated to find out that in fact it had been, when it was a flour mill, it was kind of the logical halfway mark between Fremantle and Guildford, but was actually a really hard place to land and, and wasn't a That's functional right. spot at all. No, the, the, the winds weren't quite right to drive the, the sails of the windmill uh, on a regular basis, the, the, the river traffic, and of course the river was the road in those days, um, the river traffic was, wasn't sufficient really to um, uh, be able to make this work uh, in, in the way he had hoped. And yes, there were problems in the, in the river. The river now flows quite, uh, quite uh, smoothly, but in those days there were all kinds of uh, sandbanks and, and uh, 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 little pools and, and so on that caused trouble. And so, yes, it was a difficult enterprise and the original owner, William Shenton, for whom the mill was built in 1835 and the adjacent cottages, uh, really was only able to operate it for about 20 years. Mm. The cover of the book is really interesting. Um, it's actually from a reproduction of a watercolour that was painted by Thomas Satan Brown. Exactly. Being uh, trained as an architect and engineer, he was a very skilled draftsman and like many such people, he developed his skill artistically and one of the first things he did when he came to Western Australia and got his ticket of leave, that is conditional release, um, was to take on a number of commissions to paint or draw for clients. So the one that's reproduced on the cover, which is uh, a painting held in the National Gallery in, in Canberra, is a rather lovely sunlit image of um, uh, Bunbury, but he also um, he also uh, uh, produced a number of pictures of Fremantle, street scenes, the Fremantle Asylum. Uh, he uh, produced a, a beautiful painting of the Fremantle Prison, which is now held in the Mitchell Library in Sydney. So his, his paintings and drawings survive, and although all the other things he wanted to do um, are no longer visible, there are these paintings. and, and um, he may not be one of the great painters of Australian art history, but he's a significant figure, certainly in Western Australian art, and it's good that a number of those things survive. They were part of what led me to imagine some things about his story. Mm. Oh, there, there's so much in this book. I, I highly recommend it as a read. And um, uh, I do want to ask you, though, before we wrap up today, I know you've been doing some reading too, and um, I always like to do uh, find out your recommendation on a West Australian book that you've read recently that you really enjoyed. Well, the one that came to mind when you foreshadowed that you would want to ask me this is something by another historical novelist in, based in Perth, someone whose work I greatly admire. Amanda Curtin has written uh, three books, two novels and a book of short stories, but The Sinkings is a wonderful story. Um, I have to say that when I first started to read it, I was at the stage with my own novel of having done a developed draft, but I hadn't finished it. I read the first two or three pages of Amanda's novel, The Sinkings, and I thought, I've got to stop. I can't read this any further for the moment because her story, it turned out, uh, begins in exactly the same year as mine does with exactly the same kind of event that is the death of a former convict in Western Australia. And I thought, I don't dare read any further or it will distract me in the work I still need to do on mine. So I put it aside. When I came back to it, I was greatly relieved to find that although there are, of course, uh, points of similarity and she and I have no doubt read many of the same historical sources, um, her, her story has a quite different focus. It's a wonderful story. I won't say a lot about it, but 
I admire it for several reasons. One, because it does evoke that period uh, so beautifully. It's, it's written uh, in a way that I think um, keeps taking the reader back to beautifully turned sentences, um, memorable images. So it's an eloquent book. But it's also a very, very compassionate book. Um, the story, I won't say too much about it, I hope people will read it, but it involves um, a present day researcher looking into the story behind the death of a particular convict. But what it is that draws the present day researcher to that story has to do with some very troubling things in her own relationship with her daughter. Uh, in particular having to do with ambiguous sexuality. Mm. And this becomes a focus for the story. It's very difficult material, quite confronting at times, but it's beautifully handled and uh, an admirable book, I think, one of, one of uh, Western Australia's great historical novels. Mm, thank you. It, it is a wonderful recommendation. And thank you so much for writing Mind's Own Place. I found the storytelling and the insight really fantastic and I wish you all the best with it. And thanks so much for joining me on Cover to Cover. Thank you, Mary. If you don't have a local bookshop where you can buy the books featured on Cover to Cover, then you can buy them via Crow Books in Perth. Place your order by phone and the books will be posted out to you. You can find out about literary events happening near you via the events calendar on our Proximity WA website. It has information about writers' festivals, author talks, book launches and writing workshops happening throughout regional Western Australia. You can also use this site to promote events you're organising. We've received some great feedback about Cover to Cover and we really appreciate it. In fact, in an upcoming episode, we'll be featuring an author suggested by a viewer. To contact us, use the email address shown on the screen. Next month on Cover to Cover, I'll meet Stephen Daisley. His first novel, Traitor, won the Prime Minister's Literary Award for Fiction in 2011. We'll be discussing his second book, Coming Rain, a novel written in lucid, rippling prose, which is set in the Wheatbelt region of Western Australia. Thanks for joining me. Enjoy reading local and see you next month.